It's called The Memory Thief, which is a film by Gil Kaufman, and Gil Kaufman will actually be here to discuss it. Um, it's to deal with Kristallnacht and the memory of the Holocaust. I think it's worthwhile. So it's an event tonight at 8 o'clock at 80 Wall Street. And um, so today, as you know, Melanie Phillips is here. The topic of our conversation is the demoralization of Britain, moral relativism, the Church of England, and the Jews. Um, I think before I introduce and sort of deal with some of the uh, biography of, uh, of Melanie, I want to say just on a personal note, and I, I was telling you over lunch, that um, having studied in England and having studied at Oxford as a student doing my PhD, the environment in England is very different from the environment here, and you're confronted with issues of anti-Semitism or being the other in a way which is quite different in North America. And I remember in 1989, I believe, um, when Melanie was in the, up at the Guardian, she wrote an article that dealt with issues of anti-Semitism in a way that really helped me. And she had said that if you discuss racism or issues of sexism over dinner, it makes for a wonderful dinner conversation among the chatting classes, but nothing will ever be done. But the minute you speak about anti-Semitism, you'll be faced with silence. And hearing that as a student in a new country, in a new, strange environment, was very helpful. Um, so, on that note, it's actually kind of nice in a way, at that level, that you're here today as well. Um, so, Melanie is, Phillips is a British journalist and author. She's best known for her, her controversial column about political and social issues, which currently appears in the Daily Mail. She was awarded the or Orwell Prize for Journalism in 1996. She is the author of All, of All Must Have Prizes, an acclaimed study of the British educational system and the moral crisis in the kingdom. Uh, her ideas have influ influenced politicians of, in both government and in the opposition um, on various levels. And as, as you know, people following the issues as relating to issues of anti-Semitism, Melanie Phillips has been at the forefront of dealing with the rise of radical Islamicism. She wrote a book in 2006 entitled London Stone, which is an important contribution and I think shook things up in the UK at looking at the implications of radical Islamicism within the United Kingdom. Um, she's won uh, her, uh, all kinds of acclaim and uh, she also authored uh, she was also the author of the Sex Change Society, Feminized Britain, and Neutered Male, published by the Social Market Foundation, American Social Revolution, and The Ascent of Women, a History of the Ideas Between Female Suffrage, the Female Suffrage Campaign, which was published by Little Brown. She's also wrote a play called Traitors, which was performed at the Drill Hall in London in the 1980s. So it's really a pleasure to have you here. Thanks very much, Charles. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. And I'm, as Charles has said, I'm going to talk about the situation in Britain, which I'm afraid has not really improved in the 20 years since we had that conversation, or since, when you, since you read what I wrote all those years ago at The Guardian. Um, today, British Jews find themselves beleaguered to an extent they would have thought impossible a few decades ago. Can you not hear me? Uh, can you hear me? In 2006, the parliamentary inquiry into anti-Semitism said that violence, desecration of property, and intimidation directed towards Jews was on the rise, and that as a result, British Jews were now more anxious and more vulnerable to abuse and attack than at any time for a generation or longer. Violent assaults on Jewish people have reached record levels by British standards. Jewish schools are fitted routinely now with anti-shatter glass and reinforced walls. All Jewish communal events have to be guarded, and British Jews have been forced to form their own security organisation, the Community Security Trust, since the threat is too great for the British police to handle. However, most British Jews, I must emphasise, live free of any physical threat at all. Arguably worse is the state of what I would call psychic siege in which many British Jews now feel they are living as a result of virulent anti-Israel and anti-Jewish attitudes, particularly amongst the intelligentsia and middle classes. 
a poll by the American Anti-Defamation League in 2007, reveal that half of all respondents in Britain believed it was probably true that Jews are more loyal to Israel than their own country. 22% believed it was probably true that Jews have too much power in the business world. And 34% agreed that American Jews control US foreign policy. Now, this belief that the Jews have too much power, which they use covertly to disadvantage everyone else, an ancient prejudice which would never have been considered acceptable in Britain two decades ago, is now a commonplace. Much of this focuses upon Israel and the alleged Jewish conspiracy headed by neoconservatives stretching from Jerusalem to Washington to subvert US <coughs> foreign policy in the interests of Israel and put the rest of the world in danger. In 2002, the New Statesman magazine printed an investigation into the power of the Zionist lobby in Britain, which it dubbed the Kosher Conspiracy. In 2003, the Labour backbencher Dan Tam Diel claimed that Tony Blair was, quote, being unduly influenced by a cabal of Jewish advisers. The Liberal Democrat politician Jenny Tung, who was honoured by her party with a peerage after sympathising with suicide bombers and comparing Arabs in Gaza to Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto, her punishment was to be elevated to the Upper House of Parliament, told her party conference in 2006, the pro-Israel lobby has got its grips on the Western world. I think they probably got a certain grip on our party. A distinguished general told me, without a shred of evidence, that Rupert Murdoch had ordered that opposition to the Iraq war in the Times newspaper, which he owns, should be drastically limited, quote, on the instruction of the Jewish lobby in America. Furthermore, claimed this general, George Bush had invaded Iraq because, quote, he had Ariel Sharon's hand up his back. In The Guardian last year, Jeffrey Wheatcroft lamented the fact that the British Conservative Party David, leader, David Cameron, had fallen under the spell of neoconservatives with their, quote, ardent support for the Iraq war, for the US and for Israel, close quote, and urged Cameron to ensure that British foreign policy was no longer based on the interest of, quote, another country, by which he meant Israel. Even the Darwinist superstar Richard Dawkins has got in on the act, saying, when you think about how fantastically successful the Jewish lobby has been, although in fact they are less numerous, I am told, religious Jews anyway than atheists, and yet they more or less monopolize American foreign policy as far as many people can see. And the wrong with Jewish conspiracy theory comes the revived medieval blood libel, as demonstrated in 2003 by the Independence cartoon depicting the monstrous Ariel Sharon biting the head off a Palestinian baby, a cartoon which pointedly was awarded first prize in Britain's annual Cartoonists Awards. Now, there has always been anti-Jewish feeling in Britain, but after Auschwitz it became not respectable. Now it's again mainstream. This revival of crude anti-Jewish libels is being fueled and legitimized by the obsessive vilification and demonization of Israel. It was hatred of Israel that drove Tony Blair out of office early, coming on top of huge public opposition to the Iraq war, opposition which itself arose from the belief that the real root of Muslim rage around the world was Israel's oppression of the Palestinians, backed by an America which was itself in the grip of the Israel lobby. It's hard to exaggerate the impact this anti-American, anti-Israel hysteria has had on British politics. In 2007, four British trade unions passed Israel boycott motions. The default position among the British intelligentsia is that Israel is the pariah of the Middle East, a rogue state and regional bully practicing the racist oppression of the Palestinians. Zionism has become a dirty word, seen as a doctrine of territorial conquest and colonial subjugation. And people openly say it would have been better for the world had Israel never have been created in the first place. Tyranny around the world, such as the 20-year genocide in southern Sudan, the persecution of Christians in Africa, goes almost unreported. But Israel is dwelt upon obsessively, held to standards of behavior expected of no other country, and with its own victimization glossed over or ignored altogether, falsely accused of imposing wanton suffering. Influential NGOs 
such as Save the Children, Oxfam, Christian Aid, whip up hatred by putting out a steady stream of highly unbalanced and unfair claims about Israeli repression, along with a wholly misleading account of Jewish history which fails to acknowledge that the Jews are the only people for whom Israel was its national home, while they ignore or sanitize Palestinian Arab aggression. The result is the equation of Israel with the Nazis. When the National Union of Journalists voted last April to boycott Israeli goods, a move which has since been reversed, one of its members, writer Pamela Hardiment, described Israel as, quote, a wonderful Nazi-like killing machine backed by the world's richest Jews, and referred to the so-called Holocaust before concluding, shame on all Jews, may your lives be cursed. A senior conservative member of parliament, Sir Peter Taxel, claimed during the Lebanon war that Blair was colluding with Bush in giving Israel the go-ahead to commit a war crime gravely reminiscent of the Nazi atrocity on the Jewish quarter of Warsaw. The Daily Telegraph repeated the libel, as you can see here, by publishing a cartoon depicting two scenes of devastation, one captioned Warsaw 1943, the other Tyre 2006. Yet there is widespread denial in Britain that there is a resurgence of anti-Semitism at all. The reason is that people think anti-Semitism is simply a prejudice against Jews as people and believe that this died with Hitler. The argument that attitudes to Israel may be anti-Jews strikes them as absurd because they think you can't be anti-Semitic, therefore, about a country. Well, I would suggest it's important to grasp that anti-Semitism is not just a prejudice but has unique characteristics. It applies to the Jews, expectations apply to no other people. It libels, vilifies, demonizes and dehumanizes them. It scapegoats them not merely for crimes they have not committed but of which they are in fact the victims. It is frenzied and obsessive, and it holds Jews responsible for all the ills of the world. The misrepresentation of Israel exhibits precisely the same unique characteristics. Anti-Semitism has simply mutated once again from prejudice against Jews as people to prejudice against Jews as a people. The open hostility towards Israel's actual existence and even towards Zionism singles out the Jews alone as having no right to assert their own peoplehood in their own national home. Yet Jewish peoplehood, the Jewish religion in the land of Israel, are the three legs of the tripod of Jewish identity. The attack on Zionism and Israel's existence is therefore an attack on the Jewish people. Yet the implication is that British Jews can't be truly British if they take Israel's side. Only those Jews in Britain who denounce or renounce Israel are to be fully accepted as British. Those British Jews who defend Israel against the onslaught stand accused, either implicitly or to their face, of dual loyalty. For the first time, many British Jews find themselves referred to as outsiders in their own country. They are no longer included in we, they have become you. They are accused of being driven by Jewish loyalty to the exclusion of all else, and of sanitizing the crimes of Israel by sheltering behind the claim of anti-Semitism. And when they point out the anti-Semitism behind the frenzied <coughs> scapegoating of Israel and the claims of covert Jewish power, they are told that such claims merely prove the point that Jews always try to rig the agenda to their advantage by false claims of anti-Semitism. You have this in this country with Mirshana and Walt. So to protest at the libel is merely to prove that it is true. Many British Jews are utterly bewildered by this turn of events, which is seen as an incomprehensible aberration. Until recently, they viewed Britain as the most benign environment in the world for Jews. But history shows us the relationship in Britain is far more complex. Jew hatred in Britain has very deep roots. From Chaucer to Shakespeare to Dickens to T.S. Eliot and beyond, English culture is responsible for some of the most enduring anti-Jewish stereotypes in Western culture. Central to the creation of these stereotypes was Christianity, the belief that the Jews were the killers of Christ, condemned in perpetuity, and exiled as a result from the love of God to become the party of the devil. In many ways, Britain today is, however, a post-Christian society priding itself on its rationalism and its freedom from obscurantism and prejudice. And yet, it is among the most supposedly progressive and enlightened people in Britain, the secular rationalists and the most liberal Christians, 
who march under the banner of human rights and high-minded conscience that one finds the most virulent hatred of Israel and medieval prejudice towards the Jews. To disentangle this puzzle, we have to start from the premise that anti-Semitism is the eternal hatred. It never dies for reasons which are outside the scope of this discussion. The best we can hope for is the existence of protection mechanisms that keep it down. When we look at the history of the Jews in Britain, we can see that while the default position was always general anti-Jewish prejudice, there were periods when the Jews enjoyed tranquility, not because such prejudice had vanished, but because protection mechanisms of one kind or another came into play. In the 12th century, two King Henrys granted a measure of protection to the Jews, but with the Crusades, it was then open season for slaughter. In the 17th century, Oliver Cromwell, and in the 19th century, the evangelical Christian Zionists such as Lord Shaftesbury, George Eliot, or Lord Balfour, similarly provided a measure of protection, but against a prejudice they nevertheless were forced to fight and which never went away. Indeed, anti-Jewish feeling persisted up to and even into the Second World War. In the 1930s, anti-Jewish sentiment, along with a mood of appeasement towards Nazi Germany, was remarkably similar to the situation today. When the enormity of the Holocaust was finally revealed, that prejudice went sharply underground, and so you could say that the fact of the Holocaust provided a measure of protection from overt anti-Jewish feeling. But now that protection has gone. So why has that happened? Well, one clue lies in what happened in Palestine under the British mandate. This is Britain's unfinished dirty business. Contrary to popular opinion, Britain did not bring the state of Israel into being. On the contrary, despite the famous pledge made by Lord Balfour in the Balfour Declaration, and despite being given the mandate in 1920 to recreate within Palestine the Jewish national home, the history of that mandate is a story of the systematic betrayal by Britain of that pledge. Britain's changing perception of its own national interest in the region led it to appease the Arabs by restricting Jewish immigration it had promised to facilitate, thus swelling the death toll of the Holocaust, while turning a blind eye to illegal Arab immigration and suggesting a further division of the remaining fragment of Palestine, most of which it had already given away to the Hashemite dynasty in 1921 to create Transjordan, the remainder are, would be divided into a state for the Jews and a state for the Arabs. Eventually, Britain abstained in the 1947 UN vote to bring Israel into being. And the anger at Jewish terrorism, the perception that Britain had been humiliated in Palestine, and the belief that it had been embroiled in an unnecessary and damaging project, left a reservoir in Britain of deep and lasting public resentment towards Israel. The impact of the Holocaust, however, buried that resentment along with conventional anti-Jewish feeling, and which went underground. In its early years, Israel actually basked in Britain's approval because it fitted the spirit of the age. As Europe emerged from the horrors of the war, Israel was in effect hope reborn, a young, idealistic country run on socialist principles, making the desert bloom. But when the skies darkened, and Israel became embroiled in an apparently never-ending, messy, horrible, new kind of warfare in which the Arabs could paint the Israelis as brutal occupiers and themselves as victims, the mood sharply changed. The resentful memory of the mandate and the belief formed during that time that a Jewish state would only bring trouble was now given new and virulent life. And the reasons for that could not be more profound. They relate to what has happened to Britain itself. Since 1945, Britain has changed fundamentally. The Palestine debacle was an important milestone in the collapse of the British Empire, which in turn helped bring about a collapse of belief in Britain itself and in what it stood for. During the past six decades, Britain has been systematically hollowing out its own culture for two intimately related reasons, a loss of national identity and purpose and the crumbling of religious belief that underpinned its moral codes. <clears throat> with the loss of Britain's imperial reign, together with its near bankruptcy after the Second World War and its reliance on American money to bail it out, the country's elite class was profoundly demoralized 
a state of mind which culminated in the shattering humiliation of the Suez Crisis of 1956, when a secret plot by Britain, France, and Israel to invade Egypt after NASA seized the Suez Canal was aborted when America's President Eisenhower pulled a financial plug on the operation. This demoralization left Britain's elites intensely vulnerable to ideas suggesting the emergence of a new kind of world altogether, the new Jerusalem. And this was to be an utter repudiation of the old Jerusalem, a secular onslaught against biblical morality and its replacement by the religion of the self, hyper-individualism fueled by rampant consumerism. This secularism has eroded the principles which underpin Western civilization. Chief amongst these is the concept of truth or objectivity, which Western intellectuals have now declared defunct in favor of the subjective notion of moral relativism or truth for me, otherwise known as anything goes. As a result, people are increasingly unable to make moral distinctions based on behavior. This erasing of the difference between right and wrong has meant in turn that people who do wrong, if they tick certain boxes, may be viewed with sympathy, while their actual victims are held responsible for their offense. This march of secularism has opened the door to the British and European left, which demonizes America and Western capitalism and lionizes the third world and all liberation movements. With the fall of communism, the left's focus shifted from economics to issues of culture, race, ethnic identity, and the nation state. It was Antonin Gramsci, the Marxist thinker, who became the guru of the former 60s radicals who now run our Western society, who promoted the idea that Western society could be overturned by capturing the citadels of the culture, the universities, the schools, the churches, the media, the civil service, the professions, and subverting their values. Enacting Gramsci's precepts to the letter, morality and culture have indeed been turned upside down. The values of marginalized or transgressive groups have been substituted for the values of the majority and their historic culture. The authority of the Bible has been repudiated for a culture of rights, leading Britain's intelligentsia to embrace postmodernism, anti-racism, feminism, and gay rights. The crucial point is that these are all part of a victim culture, which does not seek to extend tolerance to marginalized groups, but instead to transfer power to such groups to destroy the very idea of a normative majority culture rooted in the morality of Christianity and the Hebrew Bible. <coughs> the Christians are now targeted in Britain as bigots if they uphold Christian beliefs about sexuality. An elderly evangelical Christian suffering from Asperger's who was attacked after he held up a poster calling for an end to homosexuality, lesbianism, and immorality, was convicted in 2002 of a public order offense, while his attackers were not prosecuted on the grounds that they were the victim of the offense. A Christian registrar was threatened with a sack after asking to be excused from conducting civil partnerships for same-sex couples because of her religious beliefs, although she later won the right to do so. And the Catholic Church in Britain has been forced to cut its ties with its three large adoption agencies because equality law forces such agencies to place children for adoption with gay couples, which are against their religious beliefs. With Western culture deemed illegitimate because it is intrinsically oppressive, only multiculturalism is a legitimate basis for national identity. This holds that all major mi minority values must have equal status to those of the majority. Any attempt to uphold majority values over minorities is a form of prejudice. That turns minorities into a cultural battering ram to destroy the very idea of majority culture at all. With racism defined on Marxist principles as prejudice with power, it follows that minorities or the third world can never be anything other than victims, while the West or those with power can only ever be the victimizer. That's why the Jews, who are seen as running Western capitalism and Israel, which has nuclear weapons, are never seen as victims. Since suicide bombings are carried out by the powerless Palestinians, these must instead be the fault of their all-powerful Israeli targets. So when Muslims and Arabs invert right and wrong, truth and lies, victim and victimizer in their story about the Middle East, instead of challenging this as the big lie that it is, 
the British intelligentsia endorses, absorbs, and reproduces it. Britain has not only lost belief in itself as a nation, but European liberals have turned against the very idea of the nation itself. Rooted in the particulars of history, religion, law, language, and tradition, the nation is seen as the cause of all the ills of the world from prejudice to war. That's why supranational institutions, such as the UN, EU, International Court of Justice, International Criminal Court, and the international human rights law, which they have invented, are held to be more legitimate than the structures of individual democracies. So for these transnational progressives, the very idea of a Jewish state is double anathema. Britain's part in creating it is seen as an example of a wholly discredited colonialism, part of a Britain's original sin, which has to be expiated through the creation of a transnational and multicultural world. It is surely no accident that the Jews find themselves at the center of this convulsion because it was, of course, the Jews who first gave the West those moral codes that underpin its civilization and which are now under sustained siege. With most people in Britain ignorant of the history of the Middle East and the Jews, this moral and intellectual vacuum has been filled by Arab propaganda, painting Israeli victims as victimizers and their Palestinian attackers as their victims. This process has gained extra traction from <coughs> large numbers of Muslims who have immigrated into Britain and Europe, which has led to a craven desire to appease Muslim extremism by accepting many of its premises. This repudiation of Western values has become the default position of the intelligentsia and middle classes, shifting the whole political center of gravity in Britain, resulting in the almost total capture of the high-minded who now embrace secular bigotry under the banner of human rights. This wholesale demoralization of Britain's governing class has another very important feature. In America, the evangelical churches, the descendants of British Puritans and other nonconformists, provide a solid bulwark against the attack on Western values and on Israel and Jews. In Britain, by contrast, the mainstream uh, established Church of England has been in the forefront of the onslaught. In sermons and speeches, through Christian charities and newspapers, on broadcasting god slots, and in books and pamphlets, Christian clerics and thinkers systematically misrepresent Israel's history and libel its behavior while sanitizing the murderous crimes against it by the Arabs. In 2003, the Archbishop of Wales, Dr. Barry Morgan, said in a lecture on the relationship between religion and violence. Messianic Zionism came to the fore after the Six Day War in 1967 when biblical territories were reconquered and so began a policy of cleansing the promised land of all Arabs and non Jews rather than co existing with them. But of course, there's been no such Israeli cleansing in the disputed territories. The only attempt at cleansing has been the Palestinian attempt to kill as many Israelis as possible. The same archbishop eulogized on the death of Yasser Arafat. Quote, Yasser Arafat has given his life for the cause of the Palestinian people and will be remembered for his perseverance and resolve in the face of so many challenges and setbacks. When I heard the news of his death this morning, my initial reaction was to pray that in death Yasser Arafat will find that peace which only God can give and which was denied him in life, thus the Archbishop of Wales. In 2005, a report by the Anglican Peace and Justice Network which underpinned a short-lived move by the church to divest from companies supporting Israel, compared Israel's security barrier to, quote, the barbed wire fence of the Buchenwald camp. Thus, the Anglicans compared Jews <coughs> to Nazis on account of a measure aimed to prevent a second Jewish Holocaust. This report and its recommendations were officially adopted in June 2005 by the Anglican Consultative Council, which in turn recommended to Anglican provinces worldwide a policy of disinvestment from companies supporting the occupation of Palestinian lands. On February 6, 2006, the Anglican General Synod backed overwhelmingly a call from the Episcopal Church in Jerusalem and the Middle East to disinvest from companies profiting from the illegal occupation of Palestinian territories. Lord Carey, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, had described the previous disinvestment plea by the ACC in 2005 
as another knife in the back for Israel. Lord Carey is one of the few Anglicans who actually supports Israel. And following the Synod's decision, Lord Carey declared that he was ashamed to be an Anglican. The church later rejected the Synod's decision. Shortly before Christmas 2006, the current Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Rowan Williams, talking about the flight of Palestinian Christians from Bethlehem, blamed this on Israeli policies and the security barrier, and asked rhetorically, I would like to know how much it matters to the Israeli government to have Christian communities in the Holy Land. Are they an embarrassment, or are they part of a solution? That's the question. Dr. Williams did not mention that Bethlehem's Christians were fleeing a Muslim administration. He did not mention that all over the world, Christians were being persecuted by Muslims. He did not mention that the only country in the Middle East where Christians were thriving and their numbers significantly increasing was Israel. And he did not ask himself why, if the flight of Bethlehem's Christians was indeed caused by Israel's behavior, Bethlehem's Muslims had not similarly been driven out, but had actually increased in number. The context for this virulent animosity towards Israel is that, like the secular establishment, the church has lost faith in its own core message. As Lord Carey has put it, Britain's unthinking secularism is the context of the church's attitudes, shapeless form, and its lack of any underpinning values. And so the church has embraced moral and cultural relativism. The prevailing view, as one other bishop has observed, is that, quote, there is no one truth and we all have to respect each other's truths. Just as a collapse of confidence in Britain's purpose among the secular establishment made it receptive to cultural Marxism, so a collapse of confidence in its own core beliefs has made the Church of England receptive to exactly the same secular faith. So belief in God and in the fundamental doctrines of Christianity have been replaced by worship of, secular, of social liberalism. The church stopped trying to save people's souls and instead tried, started trying to change society. It signed up to the prevailing doctrine of the progressive class that the world's problems were caused by poverty, oppression, and discrimination. Miracles were replaced by marks. Accordingly, it soaked up the radical message coming out of the World Council of Churches under the influence of liberation theology. The problems of the poor people to the south were social and economic and emanated from the capitalist West, and from America in particular. At home, absorbing the prevailing utilitarianism which preached the creed of lifestyle choice, the church came to believe that it too was in the business of delivering the greatest happiness to the greatest number. So it went with the flow of permissiveness, supporting the liberalization of abortion, homosexuality, and divorce. And as post-moral Britain demanded that ever more constraints on behavior be knocked away, the church was forced further and further into hollowing out its own identity. As it renounced its own culture, it embraced others, while never ceasing to grovel for its one-time crime of believing in itself. As secular society denounced the crimes of British cultural and political imperialism, so too the Church of England abased itself for its own crime of religious imperialism. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Rowan Williams, apologized for bringing Christianity to the world. Addressing the Anglican Conference in Cairo in 2005, he said the church had taken cultural captives by exporting hymns and liturgies to remote parts of the world. The fact that Christianity had brought civilization to these remote parts of the world, for the very good reason that it was actually superior to practices in those parts, was of course not acknowledged. The implicit assumption was that Christian values are trumped by the belief that everyone's culture is of equal value. In similar vein, Dr. Williams has responded to Islamist terrorism with repeated examples of moral equivalence and appeasement. In writing in the dust, a meditation he wrote after 9-11 when he was still Archbishop of Wales, he wrote of the West, we have something of the freedom to consider whether or not we turn to violence. And so in virtue of that very fact, are rather different from those who experience their world as leaving them no other option. So according to this, Islamists were driven to mass murder because they had no other option. He has observed at the Palestinian-Israel deadlock that both sides know what it is to be faced with regular terror, and that the Muslim world is now experiencing, as it has for some time, and now with so much more intensity, that conscription into someone else's story 
that once characterized the church's attitude to Jews. Now, Dr. Williams' pro prose style is famously opaque, but the future leader of the Anglican Communion appeared nevertheless to be saying that Israeli self-defense against terror was morally equivalent to that terror, that attitudes to Muslims in the wake of 9-11 were morally equivalent to the church's persecution of the Jews, and that 9-11 had happened because its perpetrators could not help themselves. And in 2004, he chose one of the major seats of Islamic learning, Al-Azhar University in Cairo, to mark the anniversary of 9-11 by saying that people should not take the action that might be necessary to prevent themselves and others from being murdered, characterizing such acts of self-defense as revenge. Quote, so whenever a Muslim, a Christian, or a Jew refuses to act in violent revenge, creating terror and threatening or killing the innocent, that person bears witness to the true God. But of course, Christians and Jews do not use indiscriminate violence and terror against Muslims. It is Muslims who are indiscriminately murdering Christians and Jews. Condemning self-defense or the defense of others against murder as revenge or indiscriminate violence and terror condemns the innocent to death under the guise of godliness. It implies that if the Nazi Holocaust were to happen again, the church would once again stand aside. In the current war being waged against the West, the head of the Anglican Church is telling it to turn the other cheek. Now, the way in which the church scapegoats Israel is uncomfortably reminiscent of the historic scapegoating of the Jews for the death of Christ, and this is no accident. Because of its close involvement with the World Council of Churches, liberation theology, and interfaith dialogue, the church has been heavily influenced by Palestinian liberation theology. This, in turn, has kick-started something called replacement theology, which is sometimes known as supersessionism, the doctrine going back to the early church fathers, which stated that all God's promises to the Jews, including the land of Israel, were forfeit because the Jews had denied the divinity of Christ and so were consigned, as I said before, to the party of the devil. This doctrine lay behind centuries of Christian anti-Jewish hatred until the Holocaust drove it underground, and now it's back because Palestinian Christian revisionism states falsely that the Palestinian Arabs were the original possessors of the land of Israel. Thus, the former Anglican Bishop of Jerusalem, Ria Abu El Asal, claimed of Palestinian Christians, we are the true Israel. No one can deny me the right to inherit the promises. And after all, the promises were first given to Abraham, and Abraham is never spoken of in the Bible as a Jew. He is the father of the faithful. In a lecture in 2001, Canon Andrew White, the church's former envoy to the Middle East, the now vicar of Baghdad, observed that Palestinian politics and Christian theology had become inextricably intertwined. The Palestinians were viewed by the church as oppressed, and the church had to fight their oppressors. He said, who is their oppressor? The state of Israel. Who is Israel? The Jews. It is they, therefore, who must be put under pressure so that the oppressed may one day be set free to enter their promised land, which is being denied them. Thus, Canon and Rewai describing the attitude of his colleagues in the Church of England, against which he has valiantly and almost uniquely in that church fought for many years. The Sabeel Ecumenical Liberation Theology Center in Jerusalem, run by Father <coughs> Nayim Atik, who is a close friend of many senior <coughs> Anglican bishops, is a crucial source of systematic demonization of the Jewish state. Using the Bible to delegitimize Israel by misrepresenting the Jews' relationship with God, his book, Justice and Only Justice, inverts history, defames the Jews, and sanitizes Arab violence. Modern anti-Semitism gets one paragraph. Zionism is a colonial, aggressive adventure. Courageous Jews are those who confess to, quote, moral suicide, and say that Judaism should survive without a state. Real anti-Semitism, says Atik, is found within the Jewish community in its treatment of the Palestinians. Elsewhere, Atik has recycled and redirected the charge of deicide against the Jews. In December 2000, he wrote that Palestinian Christmas celebrations were, quote, marred by the destructive powers of the modern-day Herods in the Israeli government. In 2001, in his Easter message, he wrote, quote, the Israeli government crucifixion system is operating daily. Palestine has become one huge Golgotha. Palestine has become the place of the skull. 
and in the sermon in February 2001, he likened the Israeli occupation to the boulder sealing Christ's tomb. With these three images, Atik has figurative blamed Israel for trying to kill the infant Jesus, crucifying him, and blocking the resurrection of Christ. In 2005, Seville issued a liturgy entitled The Contemporary Stations of the Cross that equated Israel's founding with Jesus' death sentence and the construction of the security barrier with his death on the cross. So, all in all, it's not surprising that nowadays at Christmas in churches up and down Britain, we find that they have replaced their traditional manger scenes with tableau featuring the security barrier, making an analogy between the suffering Jesus and the suffering Palestinians. The Jews are killing God all over again in Palestine. Now, Sabil and Atik have many devoted adherents in the Church of England where their analysis is accepted as the norm. Stephen Sizer, the Vicar of Christ Church, Virginia Water, is a leading crusader against Christian Zionism. As Margaret Brearley has written, his book, Christian Zionism, Roadmap to Armageddon, question mark, is endorsed by many leading British and American bishops, theologians. Sizer believes that God's promises to the Jews have been inherited by Christianity, including the land of Israel. He says that Israel is fundamentally an apartheid state because it's based on race. And he says, the covenant between Jews and God was conditional on their respect for human rights. The reason they were expelled from the land was that they were more interested in money and power and treated the poor and alien with contempt. Today's Jews, it appears, are no better. Quote, in the United States, politicians dare not criticize Israel because half the funding for both the Democrats and the Republicans comes from Jewish sources. Margaret Brearley notes that Sizer denies any validity to Judaism at all, quoting the leading Anglican evangelical reverend John, Dr. John Stott to, su to suggest that the Jewish people continue to have a special relationship with God apart from faith in Jesus is, in the words of John Stott, biblically anathema. A letter to the Prime Minister in 2004 about the Iraq War from the Archbishops of Canterbury and York, backed by every diocesan, suffragan, and assistant bishop in the Church of England, showed how deeply the Church's views about Iraq were dominated by the issue of Israel, which they approached solely from the perspective of Arab and Muslim opinion. There was no mention in this letter of the rights of Israel or the Jews as the principal victims of aggression. Instead, they wrote, quote, Within the wider Christian community, we have also theological work to do to counter those interpretations of the scriptures from outside the mainstream of the tradition, which appear to become increasingly influential <coughs> in fostering an uncritical and one-sided approach to the future of the Holy Land. Who they were talking about, their target, were the Christian Zionists, regarded by the church with as much horror as the Christian fundamentalists and the Christian right who it believes hijacked American foreign policy, indeed, to the Church of England, they're all synonymous. Christians who support Israel take a variety of views about its policies, but these Anglicans see Christian Zionists as supporting an expansionist policy of greater Israel to colonize the disputed territories which they see as Palestinian on the basis of the biblical promise made by God to the Jews of the land. For many Anglicans, this expansionism, aggressive expansionism into the territories is Zionism. They don't think there's any other form. According to Canon Andrew White, replacement theology is dominant in the Church of England and is present in almost every church purely the venom against Israel. The essential problem, says White, is the lack of will in the church to face the difference between Judaism and Islam. They don't want to recognize their faith comes from Judaism, he says. They talk instead of the children of Abraham as if we are all in it together. The reality is, however, that although Islam and Judaism have a lot in common in terms of customs, they are as far apart as Christianity is from heathenism. Now, this replacement of this revival of replacement theology has achieved two results. The first is that the Church has lent its weight to the delegitimization of Israel. The second is that this conflation of revisionist Christian theology with an Arab agenda has delivered a victory to the Islamists. A view which hold that the enemies of civilization are not the Islamists but the Jews transfers righteous opposition from those who threaten the free world to their victims. And this feeds into and is in turn fed by the church's perverse desire at home to surrender to those who wish to obliterate Christianity 
from the British public sphere. I would suggest it is this visceral and ancient hostility within the church and the society it is shaped that helps explain why we're living through this hallucinatory level of anti-Israel and anti-Jew animosity. Contrary to those who think the church no longer matters in Britain, which is very much a post-religious society, I believe its influence is of the greatest possible significance, because even in our post-religious age, it still punches far above its weight in <coughs> setting the moral benchmarks for British society and culture. That culture, that influence, is now being used to promote, once again, a pre-Holocaust demonology of the Jewish people, expressed this time as hatred of Israel. It's conventional wisdom that opinion turned against Israel because David turned into Goliath after 1967. <coughs> I suggest this does not begin to explain the frenzied, obsessional nature of this hatred. Why do Israel's enemies care so much? I believe this is the expression of a complex combination of prejudice against the Jews and a profound civilizational guilt over the way Christianity has perpetrated that prejudice, a burden of guilt so unbearable that led by the church itself, the Christian world has to turn the Jews into the architects of their own destruction. In its early years, Israel basked in Britain's approval because it effectively redeemed the Holocaust. Not only had it risen from the ashes of Europe, it seemed to create a new type of Jew altogether. The black garbed moneylenders of stereotype had been replaced by fresh-faced young people in shorts making the desert bloom. With the old Jews of Europe firmly fixed in its mind as dead victims, Britain now saw instead plucky new Jews, bravely fighting off the Arab Goliath. They were under attack, for sure, but for sure they were not victims. These were tall, bronze people in this populous stereotype, planting orange groves. And what they meant, I would suggest, is that Britain didn't have to feel guilty anymore about Jewish suffering. Even after Israel occupied the disputed territories in 67, opinion did not significantly change. It was only when systematic Palestinian terror started, and Israel then had to move in to contain it, that the mood dramatically changed. I believe this is because the sight of Jews in battle dress and tanks putting down the wretched of the earth arouses in Christian Europe two overwhelming and visceral feelings. First, it revives the deep belief that the very existence of the Jews is an insult and a reproach to the essence of Christianity, which wishes deep down the Jews would simply disappear. But second, because Christian Europe has done its best over the <coughs> centuries to make that happen, and is responsible for anti-Jewish bloodbaths down through the ages culminating in the Holocaust, liberal Christians cannot accept that the Jews are locked in battle to prevent it happening once again. It reminds them of their own historic behavior. So it turns the Jews into the attackers, enabling it to condemn them, and thus release itself from the guilt it felt over the Holocaust. That's why it calls the Israelis Nazis. Relieved of its self-denying ordinance to suppress its anti-Jewish feelings, it can now use the image it creates of a Nazi Jew to slough off its own guilt. That's why the hatred explodes whenever Israel is attacked. So the more Israel and its supporters protest that the Jews are again the victims of another attempted genocide, indeed, the more Israelis are attacked, the more hostile Britain becomes. This is a source of immense pain for the many, many decent Christians who are horrified by their church's attitude and understand very well where it is leading. But the bleak and terrible fact is that the Christian world has never and will never fight to defend the Jewish people. We saw this as Germany descended into barbarism in the 1930s and Britain into appeasement. We see it now in the public indifference over Iran. Dexter Van Zyl, a Christian researcher, for accuracy in Middle East reporting, observes, since extremist movements typically attack Jews first, they evoke feelings of guilt at precisely those moments in history when Western intellectuals and religious leaders need to think clearly. We saw this with Nazism, and now we see it in response to Islamist extremism targeting Israel and the West. Progressive Christians cannot respond reasonably to the threats faced in Western civilization because it reminds them of their own historical sins which makes them think that their civilization is not worthy of a robust defense. In conclusion, Jews have always found themselves in difficulties whenever their host country loses confidence in itself. 
That is what's happened in Britain, which has upturned its founding values based on Christianity and the Hebrew Bible, and no longer knows its own identity or purpose. The upsurge in anti-Jewish feeling centered upon the state of Israel is intimately connected to this cultural confusion. Unfortunately, at present, this looks set to get worse. Britain is now being targeted by radical Islamism, which seeks to fill this cultural vacuum. And until now, the British establishment has been fatally attempting to appease it rather than uphold its own precepts. The danger is that with public feeling against Islamism running ever higher, resentment at the collapse of its national identity and the predominant attitude of a plague on all religions, British Jews may find themselves caught in the crossfire and assailed on all sides. It is not a comfortable place in which to be. Thank you. So thank you very much. So if I may, I'm going to start off with a question. First of all, for whatever it's worth, I think your analysis and overview of Christian anti-Semitism in the UK historically and how it relates to the contemporary context and the portrayal and perception of Israel is really fantastic and essential. I hope you publish it well. It's, it's really important to, that people read this. But I, my, my question is, I, I have a question, where do you go? Because on the one hand, you speak about the history of anti-Semitism as it relates to the church and Christianity and the horrible history that it has. And on the other hand, you're critiquing relativism, which I agree to an extent with the so the postmodernist relativism, the doing away with truth and ideals, I think the point out is, is a, a moral weakness that I think relates to issues of Iran and that sort of thing. But where do we go? Because on the one hand, there's this relativism that, you know, it, you hear people say, well, Israel has the bomb, the West has the bomb, so Iran should have the bomb, and it's their right. And this is, you actually hear about the rights of getting bombs, which is absurd. But on the other hand, the, the history of the church and the history of colonial Britain is a, is a history that not only affected the Jews, but it's a history that tor tormented and raped and pillaged the world. I, I did research, for example, on the Biotic Nation. The Biotic Nation were the original inhabitants of Newfoundland, Newfoundland, which is an interesting place, name of a place, in which the Biotics were systematically exterminated, and the last person died in 1876, was a woman, she died of old age, but the British, thanks to missionaries and, and colonial uh, um, military exercises, literally hunted for 123 years the biotic people, completely exterminated. And you have these things repeated in other colonial places where British and other European theologians and policymakers and army officers thought that these people were not human and not worthy of Christian charity, but had to be eliminated. So this is a no one. And then on the other hand, you, there's this relativism that's going on that you critique. So where, where do we go? Where is the place to navigate? And I just wanted to also point out, I think, I would say you're unduly harsh on the notion of multiculturalism because I think people like Charles Taylor and Michael Walzer and other scholars who are, who are concerned about diversity of society and recognizing minority rights or multicultural society, the debate is how the, you know, to recognize the practices of the other that are suitable for a liberal social democracy and to do away with practices of certain cultures and certain peoples that are not fitting fitting of a liberal social democracy. So there is a balance that they're trying to, their project is to promote a liberal democracy that's inclusive, but it only does away with the dominant culture. Well, first of all, on the Christianity point, you're absolutely right to point to um, uh, a glaring paradox in my position. And on the one hand, I'm saying that, uh, 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 certainly as far as Britain is concerned, uh, the Christian church is a very important part of the problem um, of, of uh, demonizing Jews, Israel, and appeasing Muslims. On the other hand, I'm saying that the problem has been created by the fact that we are now a post-Christian society. Um, both, I believe, are true. My enemy's enemy can sometimes be my friend. Um, I do believe it to be true that uh, nature abhors a vacuum, and that the Islamists see their opportunity and they understand very well that Britain is the weakest link. Britain is, is, is the most advanced in, 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 in the West in undoing its own culture. 
for a whole variety of reasons which I've touched on. And the Islamists can see there's a vacuum here. Yeah? They can see the society is decadent, it's literally dying, it won't defend itself, it won't die to defend its values, and so it's moving in. So in my view, um, uh, the only effective way of rebutting this is for the society to reassert its basic, fundamental, foundational values, which are Christian values. They're rooted in the Christian tradition, they're rooted in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and unless it does that, it's going to go under. Does that mean that, um, therefore, one brings back Christian anti-Jewish prejudice? Well, we've got Christian anti-Jewish prejudice because it has undone its own, its own foundational values. Um, uh, and I would suggest that the values that it's particularly undone are the Hebrew Bible. Um, and that's why one finds, I know this will be a controversial, this is itself a controversial point, one finds among evangelical Christians, those who believe in the literal truth of the scriptures, uh, one finds a much greater affinity uh, with Jews, a much more protective attitude towards Jews and, 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 and Israelites. It's those people who are the Christian right. Um, so, um, first of all, I think that civilization can't be defended unless Christianity makes itself more robust. Secondly, I don't believe that necessarily or should mean a return to medieval anti-Semitism. On the contrary, I think that would be, uh, uh, to a certain extent, a protection, uh, a protection against. And thirdly, um, if I'm saying that one has to, you know, one can't rely on, well, one can't, one can't go down the road of Christianizing Britain or Europe as protection against the Jews because Christianity is the original problem. Well, the de-Christianizing de de of Britain has produced this tremendous upsurge in anti-Semitism. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a narrow route to, to, to trade, but I think that's what one should do. As far as multiculturalism is concerned, I think there's great confusion about multiculturalism. Many people think multiculturalism simply means being nice towards the other, recognizing the other, recognizing minorities, recognizing that they have rights, recognizing that they feel beleaguered and being, being, being tactful towards them and, and making accommodation for them within a society and not being horrible. Well, that to me is not multiculturalism. That is a liberal society. A liberal society is as follows. The principles are as follows. A liberal society um, upholds its own majority value of liberalism. And within that, it is tolerant to those who form communities which are outside itself, provided those communities don't challenge it. So the deal ever since the Enlightenment has been that a liberal society is one that says, these are our values, we, uh, we uh, uh, represent, for example, um, the right to own property, uh, the right uh, not to have a religious belief, uh, uh, equality of women or, or freedom of speech. We can all you know, we, we all know what these foundational values are. Um, and within that overarching framework, we create a space for minorities to come and settle and form communities of faith and of culture. They're very welcome to do that. And we, the state, must not encroach upon them. They must have their private and protected space. That's a liberal society. The state must not interfere with them. But the quid pro quo is they must not make demands on us. They must not challenge us. So ultimately, our values trump theirs. So for example, we, are, we believe that monogamy is a foundational value of our society, and we will not tolerate polygamy. Uh, we will not tolerate burning wives, whatever, whatever it is. There are certain things which we will not tolerate because ultimately there's a hierarchy of values. And if you think there is not a hierarchy of values, you can't have a liberal society. Because the paradox of liberal society is that you have to uphold liberal values. Otherwise, you don't have a liberal society. And that's the point of multiculturalism. It's illiberal. It's anti-liberal. Because multiculturalism doesn't say, let's be nice to minorities. Multiculturalism says, everyone's values are identical in value to everyone else's. So it's not simply that minorities are equal to each other, but minority values are equal to the majority. There can be no hierarchy of values. And what that means in practice is that the minorities win. Because the minorities come along and say, I have the right to say, that these cartoons should not be published because they offend my religious faith. And that trumps your freedom of speech. And minority rights culture in Britain says, because they're minority, because they are oppressed, because they're minority, they are oppressed by us, therefore they must trump us. And that's what multiculturalism does. It inverts values. And it turns minority into a battering ram against the majority. So it becomes impossible to uphold liberal majority values. In Britain, we cannot uphold freedom of speech 
when it comes to publication, those who have cartoons, they'll publish them, partly because they were frightened of getting blown up, but because they also thought it wasn't right to give offence. So the giving of offence trumped freedom of speech. So we no longer uphold our own value. So we can no longer be a liberal society. So we can't have it both ways. Either you're a multicultural entity, in which case, in my view, you're not a society at all, and you certainly are not a liberal society, because you cannot be, because you cannot uphold liberal values. Or we are a liberal society, which says liberalism is pluralism, which means that a thousand flowers bloom, but on our terms. And that's what we've got, not well. So would you acknowledge a, a disparity between some of the intellectual writing on multiculturalism and the social policy, or you think conceptually it's a mistake? So I think Taylor, Kimlicka, Walzer, I, I don't think they would disagree with you at one level, that minority rights and pra minority practices have to fit into a social democracy. Some things are not accepted. But some things ought to be taken. So conceptually, these writers are problematic, or just in terms of policy and implementation? Um, well, I think it's both. I think some of them spray around the edges. And as in so many of these things, the language has kind of been hijacked. So we're all talking at cross purposes. You know, what is multicultural? What is liberal? Um, and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, I think some of them have tried to hold the line properly, and I think some of them have, as they say, <coughs> allowed the boundary to become permeable, and certainly not the language. Okay. And one more point, and I'll open it up. <laughs> is, is, um, did I understand you right to say that, that Christian civilization is superior, or was superior, as they expanded out to the colonies? And if so, if I understood it correctly, how were they superior to other cultures? Um, well, uh, the belief in you know, the innate dignity of every human being. Um, as they committed genocide of slaves and removed people from their lands? You know, the Christians? Yes. Well, that's an <laughs> absolutely fair point. But nevertheless, um, if you're saying that you know, um, uh, societies weren't uh, civilized by Christian values, then I mean, if you're saying that Christian values simply involve you know, genocide and enslavement, I think that's a, a really perverse interpretation of history. Um, I think that you know, Christian civilization brought great benefits to people. It gave them dignity, it gave them freedom, it gave them equality. And yes, in part, it was, it was associated with, um, uh, with, uh, uh, with great oppression. Um, but you know, if one is saying, you know, if what you're saying is that Christianity has got nothing to do with civilization, which is what you seem to be saying, um, then, uh, as I say, I think that is an extremely perverse, perverse view. I'm not saying that I just don't understand how it's superior with regard to human life and its expansion. Well, I, I don't want to get into that. I, I, I think respect for the innate value of every human life is better than having no respect for the innate value of every human life. But maybe I'm wrong. You know, I'd be interested in how you see <coughs> Uh, for me, it was a uh, big contradictory on uh, many points, and I would like to know how you see, for instance, um, gay rights eroding this liberal, um, yeah, this liberal culture in Britain. How, how this fits in. for me is uh, just a huge contradiction. Right. Well, it's quite simple. It's a question of, as I said before, it's a question of power. Um, it's uh, the, the rights agenda whether it's um, uh, the rights of cohabitants, the rights of gays, or anti-racism. It's to do with saying that um, uh, normative values are intrinsically bad, and therefore you must not have normative values. Um, the gay rights agenda to me is all about saying you know, heterosexual normative values are intrinsically oppressive, and therefore you know, everyone's everyone's lifestyle is basically has to be the same as everyone else's, regardless of everyone else's. Can I ask a follow-up question? How does that differ then from, say, um, a majority view um, in many of in many Arabic countries? Towards this point, for, for instance, I really wonder how you justify it. what. How you, yeah, how you justify this is not part of a liberal agenda, and how a majority culture is um, 
know, is, for instance, heteronormative and has to be, and how this is a, a threat if it isn't anymore. How this is a threat, for instance, if combined with the problematic, you were rightly talking about the problematic of Islamism, for instance. How does this work? Well, it's, the, 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 the Islamism is not directly associated with this. Um, I, I happen to believe that it's in individuals and society's interests for children who grow up by, mother and, by their own mother and father, wherever possible. And um, a, 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 a doctrine which says that to say that is intrinsically oppressive, um, and that therefore um, one must have equal value given to any kind of family relationship, has caused what we're now living through in Britain, which is deserts of fatherlessness, to that deserts of fatherless children. Um, uh, the abuse, the systematic, not systematic, the, the, the regular, regularized abuse of women and children in irregular relationships. The suppression of knowledge of that abuse. In Britain, we no longer collect the statistics. It's considered intrinsically illegitimate to make a distinction between married parents and unmarried parents, and we no longer have the ability to collect statistics to show what we used to show, which is that non-married <coughs> partners, um, non-married people in non-married households, or transient people going transient through through uh, through, uh, through households, um, uh, were committing hugely more abuse. We don't collect that information. Um, and so we are actively, because of <coughs> the rights agenda, we are conniving at the abuse and harm of countless thousands of people. I'm trying to understand your core point, because you made quite a few points along the way, and, um, and at a very rapid fire pace. So, but if I could return to what I think one of your core points was, so because of a number of interrelated processes, can you speak um, up, please? British British society seems to have lost its moral compass. It doesn't. It's not confident in its own mm -hmm. values anymore. The solution, therefore, is to return to values or to have some sort of clear set of values. It seems like in making that argument, um, and, and you make a very compelling point about how um, multiculturalism critique of, uh, and critique of essentialism or relativism can go wrong. Not that, I mean, I, I still haven't believed those critiques are important. You can just take them too far. But in, in making your argument, you also seem to take a series of black and white positions yourself. So for example, um, Israel is, a number of times you, you portray Israel or the West as um, portrayed only as the attacker, when in fact they're the ones being attacked. Right? So Israel is being attacked. In fact, in the case of Israel and Palestine, the situation is anything but black and white. Right? I think that if, when you're talking about attack, I think you can take a position one way or the other. It's not a moral relativist position, but it's a, are you going to say, well, Israel is only, um, in every case, um, taking a position of self-defense? I think it's a difficult position to take if you look at the facts. Certainly it is taking a position of self-defense in many cases. Um, but to say that it's always, to sort of make that sweeping generalization, is then saying the other side is always wrong, which seems to be, reverse is the point that you're actually making, um, if you follow what I'm saying. Um, what kind of imperial war of Israel are you talking about, for example? Oh, okay. I'm okay. not talking about imperial okay. war. I'm talking about um, this. The side is suicide bombing. Yeah, for example. Um, I mean, Israeli suicide bombs yeah. are there compared to the okay. terrorist okay. terrorist okay. terrorist I'm not talking about suicide bombs. I think yeah, I'm talking about the Israeli bombs. Let the question be asked. I think, if, if, I understood, if I understand you correctly, I think that we're, we're falling into, into the very trap that I'm talking about of moral equivalence. Um, you appear to think that it's kind of, it must be wrong to say that one side is right and the other side is wrong. Now, let me say from the start, I don't say that everything Israel does is correct, but that's, that's not the issue. I'm talking about sort of the fundamentals of this conflict. Mm -hmm. 
who is the aggressor, who is the aggressed. Um, the, the people who are who have a kind of moral equivalent to their lives find it an affront to say that Israel is the victim and the Palestinians or the Arabs are the victimizer because there must be a moral equivalence. The fact is, why must there be a moral equivalence? There wasn't a moral equivalence. I'm not making a direct analogy, but for example, when the Nazis came to power, there was a moral equivalence. But I didn't say, oh, well, you know, not, not all Nazis are bad, because they were clearly aggressors. Now, what's happened today is that we can't see aggressors for what they are. If you look at the history of Israel, and if you look at the, uh, uh, the, um, its military activity for the last six decades, none of it is aggressive. None of it, at all. It is all defensive. Now, some of it is very unpleasant. Some of it is highly questionable. You could say, you know, targeted assassination. There's a moral argument to be had about that. There's a moral argument to be had about its behavior in the territories, for sure. But <laughs> the only reason it's there in military force is to defend itself. And I know about the settlements, but the fact is that that land was taken as a military defensive measure. And the reason why they are in such difficulty about giving it away is because it leaves them with a military indefensible country. And the rest of it is noise. That is the essential. Look at the history. That is the essential. Now, the argument that Israel is somehow the aggressor, you know, that there is a kind of balance here. Hey, you know, as the Archbishop of Canterbury said, they're both involved in terror. They're both involved in killing innocent people. No. No. Israel does kill innocent people, but it tries hard not to. The Arabs try hard to kill innocent people. That is a morally proper position to take. The Archbishop of Canterbury is practicing moral equivalence because he sees an equivalence. Because he's, is, because he's a consequentialist, he only sees the outcome. The outcome is dead people, dead Israelis, dead Arabs. Therefore, they're both guilty of killing innocent people. No, there is all the moral difference in the world between you know, an, an, an onslaught through suicide bombing which is trying to kill as many innocent people as possible, quite explicitly, and a military maneuver by Israel, which is trying to kill the people perpetrating the terror, which also kills innocent people, which they quite clearly and demonstrably, more than any other military force in the world, try to prevent. There is no other country in the world which puts its troops in harm's way like the Israelis do in order to avoid killing innocent people, which they sometimes do. So I don't get this equivalence. It's not a question of, you know, you can't say there's black and white. I'm afraid in wars, there are people who start wars and people who defend themselves against them. There are people who are aggressors and there are people who are aggressed. Does that mean the people who are aggressed against behave well all the time? No. But it does mean you cannot and should not go down this road moral. Getting back to Britain, you had mentioned that there was a religious and cultural vacuum in Britain which Islamicists are attempting to fill. In that vein, do you see Shia law becoming <coughs> accepted in Britain? And if so, what are the implications of two legal systems in one country? And can, can uh, people choose the system of law that they favor? Um, well, this is a very uh, very topical and very fraught area. Uh, it's, been, it's been heightened by the fact that there have been a couple of very high-profile speeches that you may have heard about. One by the Archbishop of Canterbury, one by the former Lord Chief Justice, Lord Phillips, saying that um, there is no problem with Sharia law, that we have nothing to fear, there is no threat to our mainstream values, and that when it comes to um, a, 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 a separate or parallel jurisdiction, the Jews have it in uh, their own religious courts in the Battery Day. Now, uh, there's also been some talk recently that various speeches made by government ministers have suggested that Sharia law is now being, is now being taken on by the 
uh, indigenous um, system of English rule and is being given uh, official status. Now, that isn't actually true as far as I can see. Uh, nothing has actually changed. The situation in Britain is that, like the Jewish community, British Muslims have their own system of courts, Sharia courts. As far as the British state is concerned, these courts, like the Jewish courts, are considered to have no status uh, in English law. Um, uh, they have the status of uh, any kind of informal um, arbitration agreement reached between bodies of people. The state has no interest in it. Um, the problem has arisen because um, the principles applied in these Sharia courts, by these Sharia courts, are principles which British people find offensive, and many Muslims find offensive, because, for example, they institutionalize the inferior status of women. And so people are very upset by this, but they don't know what to do about it, because at the moment, the Sharia courts are not actually, don't have any different status from, say, the Jewish courts. The, 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 the difference is that the Jewish religious courts don't uh, rule on matters of personal status like marriage or divorce. They very explicitly say, you know, the Jews live in, live in Britain under the law of the land. The law of the land is the law. There's one law for all. And so all the arbitration agreements by the Jewish courts are really informal, informal agreements. If you're married as a Jew in Britain, if you're divorced, you have to be divorced or married according to English law. And the problem with the, with the Sharia courts is that they don't want that. They want to replace uh, uh, English law, and they're pushing all the time for that to happen. And they are validating polygamous marriages, which the British state doesn't, doesn't recognize. But nevertheless, these women who are in these polygamous situations are tremendously disadvantaged. So we do have a growth of, because there's more and more of this Sharia law happening, more and more Muslims, more and more of this activity, we do have a growth of a parallel system. Um, and no one yet knows what to do about it, because at the moment, it does not, you know, it doesn't depart from principles of British society, which is that there is one law for all, in that the British state doesn't recognise it. But it clearly is not one law for all, because there's a sick shape on the community which is living under rules which are quite inimical to our principles, such as equality and freedom. So this is a big test for a liberal society. What do you do? No one's got the answer to this. Do you say, well, a liberal society must accept this because, you know, Sharia courts, you know, they're entitled to do it, and so you, you turn a blind eye to it? you turn a blind eye to it, so in which case you're turning a blind eye to oppression by your, of your, your own British citizens. Um, or do you say there is something particular about Sharia law which you've got to stop? No one in Britain would talk about that, because that is discrimination. Um, so we are stuck. At the moment we are completely stuck, we don't even know quite what we're talking about, because um, the intersection between different kinds of jurisdiction is a bit of a grey area. A few weeks ago, a 13-year-old child, I don't know in what country, but in a Muslim country, was stopped, was found guilty of adultery after she had been gang raped. And she was consequently stoned to death. Uh, did that cause any, any reverberation in the UK? Uh, she was stoned to death. Where was this? In, uh, in Somalia. In, in Somalia. Uh, the British are not waking up and looking at their breakfast, looking at their papers over their breakfast table and saying, you know, I'm really worried about this, what's going on in Somalia. They really don't care. They don't care at all. As long as it doesn't happen, it's. But then, you know, this is Sharia law. Yes. It could also be then happening there, we're talking, or, you know, oh. then we can add genital uh, mutilation, etc., etc., well. etc., et 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 and as you said, polygamy, forced marriages, uh, It's clearly really against British law. Mm -hmm. It's against the law of the country. And people would expect that if that were to happen, then the perpetrators would be prosecuted. But would they be? Well, one hopes they would. Um, I am not aware yet of anybody <coughs> being stoned to death in Britain. Uh, there are things going on below the radar, no question. What about happen. honor killings? Yes, honor killings are going on, um, and the police are trying to get on top of it. Um, there, is a, there is a major problem getting on top of it, but the police are trying to get on top of it. Um, uh, for sure, it is a 
I do a, a big issue, a big issue in Britain. But when you say people look at you know what's happening in Somalia, they don't have to, you know, they know about you know what Sharia law means um, in in in, in Arab Muslim countries. Um, uh, the issue is, you know, to what extent people think that this is the way, is the way we're going in Britain, and most people um, are worried, but they don't think we would go that far. I have another question. How many Jews live in, uh, in the UK? Well, the number of Jews who are identifying Jews, that is to say, um, uh, Jews who are uh, affiliated to a synagogue um, in some way, is about 280,000. And uh, are there voices in the Jewish community, if you want to call it that, that uh, uh, loudly speaks out against this, uh, these issues that you're raising? Against what issues? Uh, well, the, the, the blatant anti-Semitism mm -hmm. uh, disguised under, under, under anti-Israelism and the fact that Israel is the only country in the world which is uh, subjected to different yeah. standards. Well, um, the, the, the short answer is that the Jewish leadership, the, the, the leadership of the Jewish community is almost entirely, in fact, it is entirely silent on this, um, and takes the view that to talk about it is to create a problem. As far as the boycotts are concerned, um, a group of Jews on the left uh, rose up against their own people on the left, as it were, and fought the boycotts, um, and have... Uh, have understood the link between the boycotts of Israel and anti-Semitism and, and have made the argument that the two are linked. Um, but they are a pretty marginal um, group of people. Um, mainstream, the mainstream Jewish leadership is pretty silent. Thanks. Uh, both here today and in many of your writings, you've sounded uh, the alarm about the rise of both anti-Semitism in Britain, um, the surrender to a radically Islamist agenda in many sectors of British public life, and its accommodation by the church and the intelligentsia and so forth. Have you at least recently seen any signs of uh, renewal, of hope, of opposition to this? Are there any things that we could say, uh, take heart from? Or is the evidence that you've seen in England one that counsels despair? Well, um, I, was, I was talking to somebody earlier about this. Um, there was a, uh, in what, what year it was, it was last year, and part, there was a, a, there's a parliamentary committee on anti Semitism which convened an inquiry into anti Semitism in Britain and produced a reasonably hard hitting report. And I think it was reason, only reasonably hard hitting, but by conventional standards it was like a shock to everybody. Um, uh, and it produced this report, um, it, the, the, the chairman is a non Jew, uh, from a, 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 a Labour member of parliament. Um, the, the two, two, two members of parliament most associated with it are both Labour and members of parliament. And they produced this extremely effective inquiry report, uh, which I quoted from it at the beginning. Um, it said, you know, the British Jews are under great stress and so on. And on the basis of that, um, the chairman of the inquiry went to um, the British government and said, what are you going to do about this fact? Children in Jewish schools are having to be guarded the whole time. And apparently, uh, the minister in question said, we never knew. We never knew. We find this unbelievably. We never knew. And proceeded to give money to help guard Jewish children in schools. So there is, you know, that's, that's progress. Um, that just wasn't in existence before. There is also a fight back going on. I mentioned um, the group of left-wing Jews who have taken on the left over boycotts. Uh, there is now um, a, a body of people who are training uh, Jewish students uh, in uh, ways of running the gauntlet, ways of fighting back on campus against the lies of demonization. Um, so there's a certain amount of that sort of fight back going on. Um, the, over, the overriding problem, however, is, is, is that the media in Britain is, is, you know, carries the prejudice of the intelligentsia. And consequently, a whole lot of people who are not of the left or the right, they're just sort of middle of the road, apolitical people, they just have come to believe the lies. And 
the result of that is that they don't actually understand the threat, as I would see it, to the West. They think that, you know, they don't like the encroachment of Muslims in Britain, but as far as trying to blow us up is concerned, they think that's because of Israel and because America supports Israel. And, and uh, consequently, they don't accept the need for more measures to deal with terrorism very easily. Um, and uh, they don't see uh, the link between, you know, the demonization of Israel and anti-Jewish attitudes, because they don't accept the demonization of, of Israel. So the atmosphere is, is not very nice. Um, so that default position, I'm afraid, there's, there's no sign of that changing at present. And until and unless that changes, we're not going to make much progress. Um, I heard uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs spoke here in Connecticut, and he seemed to be more hopeful of some kind of work between the government. In fact, he was part of it, where they're working on a situation where minorities who have their particular ways of life are not allowed, just the way you said, to, to force their way upon the others. And uh, he spoke very forcefully about that. And I was left to believe that a lot more was being done on that. You covered that, that that's what should be done. And apparently, he is involved in that and trying to make that stick. Uh, are you familiar with his work? Uh, I'm not quite sure what precisely you're, you're referring to. There are various uh, initiatives, but I'm not sure which, what Well, he, he spoke in, in the lecture that he spoke about that um, Britain was conscious of the fact that there were Muslims that were trying to force their, their Sharia yes, law yes, upon yes. the society, right. and that there must be a general tone of the government and a rule that this should not be permitted to happen. Yes, yes. And I thought it was further along um, hearing, anyway, I was led to believe it was he further may, along. He may have, he may be privy to information that I don't know, uh, which gives him more cause for optimism. Um, but as far as Islamism is concerned, um, I think the government of British currently has taken a, a really quite alarming um, Strategic, they made an alarming strategic mistake uh, because they don't accept that this is a religious war we wage um, of conquest. Um, they think that it's to do with grievances and all kinds of other stuff. And um, consequently, they are, as I said in my remarks, they've bought into quite a lot of this, of the, um, the false narrative. So, for example, the, the essence of the, of the um, Islamist narrative is that uh, Islamic terrorism has nothing to do with Islam. And the British government basically agreed. So you have the Home Secretary as the lead minister for internal security um, standing up and saying um, that uh, the terrorism that we're facing is anti-Islamic activity. Can you your head around that? Yes, yeah, yeah. So that's where we are. So you know, to say that the British government actually understands it's on the whole well, line, um, well, I hope that's true. Whatever. I'll take two questions and then we'll Just very quickly, uh, back to this question of the Sharia courts. <clears throat> then there were some news reports that the UK regular courts were in fact okaying the decisions of the Sharia courts. That was a false report. It's I'm, I'm hesitating because I'm myself I'm not entirely sure about uh, about this. But as far as I can see, um, it's a little muddled. Um, and if, es essentially, uh, those reports were, were, were a bit of a model. And essentially, um, I don't think there's any change. I don't think that the uh, government or the courts have done or said anything to change the relationship between the status of Sharia courts, which are informal, and the law of the land. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be concerned about what Sharia courts are doing. But that's, that's, that's not a change. So let's collect two questions very quickly. Uh, right, thank you. Um, you said that Britain was having a problem in simply denying its foundational values. Would you agree that perhaps we are trying quite deliberately to create new foundational values, which are based on, say, human rights, supranationalism, and so forth? And my generation, and I presume to speak, my generation both here at Yale and back home, 
um, see themselves quite seriously as good people, and these are the new foundational values. Um, and on that basis, but again, my generation, I think, here and back home, the default setting is not only anti-Israel, but virulently anti-America. And the actual concluding question here is, given the ecstasy uh, resultant on the election of Barack Obama, what do you hope um, or fear for the next four years um, for the Middle East from an Obama presidency? I'm sorry, that's one point for one question. Okay. Um, I think I'll just respond to that one. Um, you're correct that um, it's not just your generation, it's also my generation. Um, uh, believes it, and this is what I refer to, transnational progressivism. And it is, it's good people who want to create a better world. And they want to eradicate uh, prejudice and war. Unfortunately, history tells us, from the Jacobin onwards, that people who want to change society and change human nature end up as fascists. And that's where we go. Um, transnational progressives are against democracy. Transnational progressives base are based their idealism on this idea that we are all bound by universal values which trump the values of individual nation states, which are in themselves illegitimate because they exclude the other, because they're rooted in the particular of Christianity, of the West, of well. Um, and thus they prevent, so transnational progressives are all about preventing members of a culture um, identify themselves as that culture and governing themselves as that culture. And when it becomes a kind of racial culture, as in Israel, it becomes double anathema. Um, now, so therefore, what starts as apparently an idealism becomes very rapidly a really terrible oppression, which is, I think, why we are living in this upside-down universe. And human rights are a classic case in point, where, you know, it is, you know, Human rights are asserted as universal, but they are entirely contingent on individual judges or courts bringing to bear their own assumptions and ideas and prejudices and opinions to interpret and to decide which values should win over which. So they are man-made um, and they're contingent and therefore they oppress some people and therefore they diminish liberty. Um, rather than create it. Now, my concern about President-elect Obama is that my reading of him is that he is uh, absolutely in line with transnational progressivism. Uh, his statements, um, if you look at what he's saying about, you know, uh, what he has said in the past about um, America's role in the world, seems to me, seems to me to be based on this idea that America has to expiate its sin uh, for defending its own culture and its defending its own society and uh, 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 asserting its values in the world. And indeed, there's one remark, I can't give you the precise quote, but he was reflecting on the evil that's done in the world and he said America has created that evil. In other words, 9-11 is America's fault. That's how I interpret it. Not that, he would, not that he has said that or would say that in those terms, but that is the logical trajectory of what he is saying. He and the Archbishop of Canterbury have been on very well. Um, so my fear, my fear is that he will be true to himself. My hope is that he's only been cynical. And that faced with the circumstances that he is faced with, he will uphold once again America's right to